Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Get Nebula for free when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Let's talk about GPT-3. For those who don't know, GPT-3 is a massive language model that was developed by OpenAI in early 2020. Now, you might be wondering, Jordan, GPT-3 came out months ago. Why are you just now making a video on it? And the answer to that question is that when it comes to models like this, I don't usually like to review them for all of you before I've had a chance to use them myself. This is because it can be hard to form an opinion based on secondhand, and in this case, thirdhand and fourthhand experiences from other people. Now, that didn't end up happening for reasons that I'll get into later in the video, but waiting a few months did do something a bit unexpected. It gave me the opportunity to watch the evolution of GPT-3 over time and gain some insights that I don't think I would have had if I had had access to it when it was originally announced. So let's talk a bit about GPT-3 and whether or not it's actually worth the hype. Like its predecessors, GPT-2 and GPT-2, GPT-3 is a language model based in a type of model called a transformer. Transformers, as the name might suggest, are designed to transform input sequences into output sequences depending on the type of task that you're trying to do. And these sequences can be text, but they can also be images, they can be audio for speech recognition, anything that you can form into a sequence. Unlike recurrent neural networks, which also handle sequences and which we've talked about in other videos on my channel, transformers are nice because they can keep track of really long sequences, so they don't forget something that appeared at the beginning of the sequence by the time it gets to the end. Compared to its predecessors, GPT-3 is a really large language model with 175 billion parameters, and its size is one of the reasons why it's so good at generating long-form text that sounds like a human wrote it. However, the size is also what makes GPT-3 adept at tasks that it has limited to no experience with, such as using words that it hasn't seen before in sentences and literally doing math. In fact, the original aim of the paper that became GPT-3 was essentially to see what happens when you make these models bigger and bigger. Now, GPT-3 was trained on a lot of different data sets, including the entirety of Wikipedia, millions of books, as well as text scraped from web forums like Reddit. And interestingly, while most of the text is in the English language, about 7% of it is actually in other languages, which is a recent phenomenon in the field of natural language processing, which has historically focused on the English language. In short, based on the initial results from OpenAI, as well as some preliminary work from other researchers, GPT-3 is an extremely powerful language model that performs well on both tasks it has seen before, like text generation, as well as tasks that it hasn't. However, these results do come with some caveats that the authors of the original paper describe, including performing poorly on common sense physics questions, producing repetitive texts, and poor sample efficiency, which essentially means that to train GPT-3, you have to show it more words than the average human sees in their lifetime, and it's still not as good as us. Additionally, the authors did some preliminary work on highlighting fairness and bias issues with GPT-3 and found that the model associated occupations with men, associated negative sentiment with black people, and associated Islamic terms with terrorism. This isn't super surprising given that we know that these data sets tend to have those correlations in them because that's how we've historically written and it reflects our society, although not aware of much work as to whether models like GPT-3 actually amplify those biases further. They also include a section on energy usage, which is pretty vague, but essentially states that training GPT-3 required two to three orders of magnitude more computing power than the next biggest GPT model. And this isn't great for a lot of reasons, namely that 99.9% .9 of research groups don't have access to that kind of computing power and wouldn't be able to use or research models like this, as well as the fact that training models like this is not great for the environment. And as with most models of the size of GPT-3, it is difficult to understand how it makes decisions because there's just too many parameters to parse. All right, so if we consider that GPT-3 is a rather powerful language model that comes with some non-trivial bias issues, it seems reasonable to expect that the developers would take extreme care in how they release said model to the public, or if they did at all. And this is especially true when you consider that language models, which are designed to generate text that sounds like a human wrote it, are not designed to generate text that is true. This isn't to imply that researchers are intentionally designing models that would spread misinformation, but to highlight the fact that we haven't really figured out a way of embedding fact-checking into language models because there's no real probabilistic way to do it. To address their concerns and mitigate possible misuses, OpenAI has a history of doing something called a staged release when it comes to their models. 
A staged release is when a group of researchers decide to allow increasing access to the model to different groups over time, with different groups getting different levels of access in the model based on some set of limitations. For previous language models such as GPT-2, the model was only released to fairness and bias researchers who went on to characterize the fairness and bias issues with that model. Once the models had been characterized and that work had been published, OpenAI went on to release those models to the public with some fixes. However, the release strategy for GPT-3 was a little bit different. Their approach focused on taking applications for limited access to the model through an API or application programming interface. Giving people access to the API instead of the actual model meant that no one outside of OpenAI had access to GPT-3 itself, but instead were able to test GPT-3 by giving it different inputs and changing a limited set of parameters. From OpenAI's perspective, this is arguably a safer approach to limiting the potential for misuse because it restricts the people who have access to the model and lets the owner keep track of who might be misusing the model as well as any issues with the model itself. However, many other researchers in the field don't particularly agree with that approach, instead believing that models like this should be released to the public so that more researchers can work to solve these problems faster, as well as to prevent companies like OpenAI from being the sole arbiter of who gets access to a model and who doesn't. Personally, I fall somewhere in the middle. I think that the API was actually a good idea because it lets them keep track of who and how the model is being used, assuming that's something that they are actually keeping track of. On the other hand, I thought that the application process for accessing the API, while likely well-intentioned, highlighted the issues with having a single entity determine who can have access to models like these and who can't. In short, the application asked for a short summary of what you plan to do with the model and whether or not you were doing it for research or just for fun. And in theory, this lets OpenAI approve applications on a case-by-case -case basis based on whatever internal standards they have for approving or denying applications. In practice, this meant that they were flooded with over 10,000 applications in the first week and are still drowning in applications to this day about six months later. It also meant that the process of deciding who gets access to the model was extremely opaque. Some well-known researchers got access to the model, some didn't, some random people with fun projects got access to the model, others didn't, and most of us never heard back. In fact, having talked to some other AI YouTubers like Rob Miles and Jabril's, none of us ever heard back on our applications. <laughs> And I don't want the takeaway from this to be that people shouldn't be allowed to have access to models like these to do non-academic, more fun projects, because I do think that it's important to release models to people who span the spectrum of machine learning research and development so that you can see the different use cases that different types of people have for models like these. However, I do think that when one entity decides who gets access to models like these and who doesn't, it tends to guide research in that field because you're only going to see published papers from people who have access in whatever discipline they might be. And that can have important and significant ramifications for the direction that that field ends up going in. Now, interestingly, when it comes to the research front, I wasn't actually able to find that many papers of people using GPT-3, which tells you something about how the API and application approach went for them. There may be more papers in the pipeline that I'm not aware of, but between the restrictions that the API puts on how much you can use the model and the limited release, it seems like the population of people who can do research on GPT-3 outside of OpenAI is pretty small. In terms of the research that was there, most of them focused on characterizing fairness and bias issues within GPT-3, although the level of access that the API gives you to the model, from my understanding, is pretty limited, so it's also likely that anyone who does have access who is a researcher might not be able to do the kind of thorough work that they would like to. On the more fun side of things, GPT-3 has been used for anything from code generation to writing ad copy for your products to making nuclear waste sites safer. In fact, if you're curious about how other people are using GPT-3, I'd highly recommend taking a look through Greg Brockman's Twitter feed because he's been retweeting a lot of the cooler projects. In all seriousness, it turns out that there may be a way to gain access to GPT-3 after all, for a price. OpenAI announced their partnership with Microsoft in 2019 and in 2020 announced that they would exclusively be licensing their API to Microsoft for use in their products and services. This means that you'll likely be able to use GPT-3 either as a standalone service or as an integration in some other sequence-based learning service through Microsoft Azure. Having said that, it's unclear how much access will cost, so I wouldn't necessarily expect the average person who just wants to play around with GPT-3 to have this as a real option. Is that bad? 
In principle, I want to say yes, because I think that restricting access to only people who can afford to pay for the model reduces the number of interesting perspectives you might have on it. But at the end of the day, OpenAI is a company that needs to make money in order to continue doing research, and this API is one of the ways that it looks like they're going to be doing that going forward. So the only criticism that I can really have of their licensing deal with Microsoft is that they've claimed so far to be pursuing the democratization of AI and putting models like GPT-3 behind a paywall kind of does the opposite. So is GPT-3 worth the hype? Honestly, it depends on what you mean. When it comes to developing larger and more powerful soda or state-of-the-art models, yeah, GPT-3 is another step in that direction, advancing on past work in language modeling and transformer models. But for me, that's also why it's not really worth the hype. And at the end of the day, models like those, while they do represent advancements in the field, don't usually represent advancements in our lives, especially when most people can't use them or research them to develop even better models. And when it comes to misinformation, while I don't want to undersell the impact that GPT-3 might have on that ecosystem, there are plenty of smaller and much more straightforward machine learning models that already do a great job at spreading misinformation. And I don't get the impression that GPT-3 will impact that ecosystem very much, especially considering the extremely limited release. So when it comes to the question of the title, I think that it certainly deserves acknowledgement as an accomplishment in the field. But when it comes to clickbait headlines about how this article was written by a robot, I think we can all settle down a little bit. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm always a little bit hesitant to form strong opinions on models before I get the chance to use them. So perhaps you'll see me riding the GPT-3 hype train if I ever get access to the API. In fact, I would love to do a follow-up video once Microsoft makes GPT-3 available to the public. However, videos like that can be hard to make for YouTube because they're for a fairly niche audience, which in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm makes them bad videos. That's why my creative friends and I teamed up to create Nebula, a platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and we can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about the secret history of the internet? Check out the series Digits, where Derek Muller talks to internet insiders to learn more about how the internet started and where it is now. Where CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula because we want a place for education creators to try out new content ideas that might not work on YouTube. You'll find some of your favorite creators from Up and Adam to Medlife Crisis to Braincraft, and you can find those deeper dives into interesting papers by watching my monthly Nebula Journal Clubs where we untangle papers related to one of the topics I cover in my normal videos each month. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code Jordan, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plan, with Nebula included for free as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Clicking on that link really helps out my channel, so if you would like to support me while getting to watch all of my videos ad-free, sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the promo code JORDAN or at curiositystream.com slash Jordan. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out my videos in the AI 101 series if you want to learn a little bit more about models like Transformers. If you want to follow my PhD life, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and otherwise, I'll see you all on Monday. Bye!